everyone what's up welcome back to another episode of killer instinct if you're new here hi my name is savannah and i am your host of killer instinct before we get started make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button that way you never miss an episode we post weekly on the podcast every wednesday and then again every thursday on youtube as well and you are not going to want to miss it Now for today's episode, as you guys can tell by the title, today we are talking about the heartbreaking case of Tori Stafford. And I do want to put a trigger warning slash disclaimer on this episode that today we are going to be talking about the death of a child. It was a very brutal death. And if this episode is not for you, no worries. I will see you next week. Now, this was an episode that was heavily requested by you guys and was one that I was getting flooded in my DMs and in my Killer Instinct email. You guys were constantly asking me about it. More recently, actually, it was kind of like an influx of Tory Stafford requests. So I knew that this was a case that I wanted to look into and clearly one that you guys wanted to hear as well. And when I started looking into it, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It's horrible. So if you're unfamiliar with the case or if you already are familiar with the case, either way, sit back and let's jump right on into it. Victoria Elizabeth Marie Stafford, who went by the name Tori, was born on July 15th of the year 2000 to her parents, Tara McDonald and Rodney Stafford in Woodstock, Ontario. Now, growing up, Tori lived with her mother as well as her older brother, Darren, and her parents separated very shortly after Tori was born, and Tori and Darren did not have a very smooth nor stable childhood. Both of their parents were very experimental when it came to drugs, so a lot of the times, Tori and Darren would stay at their grandmother's house. By the time Tori was in the eighth grade, she had already attended eight different schools because her family had moved around so frequently, and they also struggled financially as well. Sometimes to make ends meet, their mother, Tara, would take her kids' toys and bring them to pawn shops to exchange them for money, and on Tori's 2008 Christmas list, she put a laptop, Bratz dolls, and all of my stuff back from the pawn shop. And I don't want to sit here and trash talk Tori's parents by any means. They both had kids when they were very young. However, it took them a while to get on their feet and they weren't doing it in the healthiest way. And because of that turbulent and unpredictable upbringing, it made Tori and Darren very, very close. They had an extremely close relationship and bond. Darren actually said, quote, my sister was the only person I had to talk to. Someone that felt what I felt, cried when I cried, laughed when I laughed, and now I feel alone, like the world is playing a sick trick on me, end quote. Tori Stafford was nine years old at the time of her death, and at that time, she was your typical bubbly nine-year-old girl. She loved Bratz dolls. She loved Disney shows like High School Musical and Disney Princesses. She also loved spending time with her older brother, Darren. She loved her grandmother. She loved her parents. She was an incredibly loving little girl. So this all brings us to April 8th of 2009. On this day, Tori had gone to school like any normal day. She attended Oliver Stevens Public School. Now, Tori, her mom, and her brother had actually recently moved into a new house the week prior to this, and the house that they moved into was in walking distance of the school. And Tori and Darren attended the same school together. So finding this house that was in walking distance was really great because what it meant was that Tori and Darren were going to be able to walk to and from school together. And on April 8th, this particular day, this plan was going to be finally put into place. Now, instead of both Tori and Darren being dismissed from classes and walking home from school at the same time, Darren actually decided to walk home some of his friends. It's not clear why he decided to do this, whether these were, you know, his friends and he just wanted to spend some extra time with them, or if there was a specific reason they needed to be walked home. Darren was only 11, so it's not like he was some 
babysitter or authoritative figure in any way, but we don't know why exactly he walked his friends home. Now, what we do know though, is that these friends lived right next door to the school. So it was literally, you could see their house from the school. So Darren decided that he was going to walk with these friends to their house and then just turn around, come back to the school, grab Tori, and the two of them were gonna walk home together. But by the time Darren came back from school and was looking for Tori, she was nowhere to be found. Now, Darren was a little confused because it wasn't like he was gone for very long. He really was only gone for around 10 to 15 minutes, if that, but Tori was nowhere to be seen. Now, at first, Darren thought that maybe Tori just didn't feel like waiting for him and she decided to walk home on her own. And so he decided to just start walking in the direction of his house. Now, by the time Darren got got home and realized that Tori wasn't there, that's when this sort of sinking feeling set in. When he got home, he told his mom, Tara, what had happened and said that he didn't walk with Tori home from school. He didn't know where she was. And that's when he decided to get on his bike and start riding around the neighborhood. However, unfortunately, he didn't find her there either. Now, while Darren was out doing that, Tara started making some phone calls to some of Tori's friends, thinking it was possible that Tori could have just piggybacked along with one of her friends and decided to go over to their house for the day. However, no one had seen Tori. And throughout this frantic search for Tori, Tara had also called her mother. So Tori's grandma and told her what was going on. And Tori's grandmother was actually the one that filed the missing persons report at 6.04 PM on the night of April 8th. Now, when police arrived to Tara's house and started speaking with her, it did not take them long to start raising some eyebrows and pointing some fingers at her. Police thought that it was odd that Tara waited so long to contact the police and she wasn't even the one that filed the missing persons report, which also raised more suspicions. And it also did not help with the fact that Tara had a history of drug abuse and had her own rap sheet of sorts. So all of those factors combined, it wasn't looking good for Tara. However, regardless of their suspicions, police still hit the ground running in the search for Tori. Now, Tori's school was actually canceled for several days after this, five days to be exact, out of the fear and uncertainty of no one knowing what exactly happened to Tori. Because if there really was this abductor or kidnapper on the loose, police wanted to arrest them and decrease the risk, obviously, of other children possibly going missing. So police were searching everywhere. However, they really weren't coming up with anything. They had no leads and no idea what could have happened to Tori. However, that was until there was a break in the case. Police were able to look at CCTV footage from Tori's school. And when they did that, that's when they discovered something. On the footage from the day and time that Tori went missing, police actually saw on video Tori walking away from her school with another woman. Now in the video, Tori didn't seem like she was concerned or in any distress or was being pulled away against her will. She was just seen walking with this woman in what appeared to be a very voluntary way. Now, because of that, police pretty automatically made the connection that this had to be someone that Tori knew, considering she seemed to walk away very voluntarily. This did not seem like she was being, you know, pulled away against her will, like I said. And along with that, the video footage wasn't super clear. It wasn't high quality. However, it seemed like the woman in the video had very similar features to Tori's mother, Tara. Police were very, very suspicious of Tara because think about it. Who is the one woman that Tori is probably going to feel the most comfortable with? It's more than likely going to be her mom. And people were very critical of Tara from the get-go. So not just police, I'm talking the public. Tara did multiple media interviews and everyone was analyzing her body language and her tone and what she was saying which is not uncommon. A lot of people do that in these types of situations, but a lot of people were very critical over the fact that Tara didn't seem to have a lot of emotion when it came to talking about her daughter, talking about the situation, 
And basically people were upset over the fact that she was not crying. She seemed like she was having a very normal conversation when talking about the fact that her daughter was missing. And it definitely didn't help when in days after Tori's disappearance, Tara and Rodney, who is Tori's father, did a media interview together. And Rodney definitely threw Tara under the bus on this one. Tara was expressing to the media how she was being criticized and people were overanalyzing her because she doesn't show a lot of emotion. And people were saying that because she wasn't crying in these interviews that she had to have some involvement in the disappearance of her daughter. But then things got a little messy when she started comparing other child killers and other specifically mothers who had killed their children. And they very quickly did media interviews where they were showing an excess of emotion and crying hysterically. So she's comparing other mother killers to herself and saying that just because I'm not crying doesn't mean I killed my kid because look at all these other people who were crying and they ended up killing their kid. Now, Rodney took a lot of offense to this because he, unlike Tara, was very emotional when it came to the subject of his missing daughter, obviously. And when talking to press, he was very emotional. He was crying. And during this interview, Rodney actually calls Tara out and he said, you know, what are you trying to say? Are you saying that because I'm crying that I had something to do with this? And Tara, you know, reacts and says, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just talking about myself. This is where Rodney actually ends up turning on Tara. You see it on camera. He actually starts to agree and vocalizes that it is weird that Tara isn't being very emotional when it comes to the disappearance of their daughter. And why wouldn't you, even though there is cameras, who cares about the cameras? Like this is your daughter. Like why wouldn't you show emotion about it? So he's really throwing her under the bus in front of all of this media. And obviously the media is eating this up because that is what they do. So this really doesn't look good for Tara because you have the father of their child now turning on Tara and saying, you might actually have had something to do with this. Why aren't you crying? Why don't you have emotion? So you have that along with public scrutiny towards Tara, along with the fact that police believe that Tara is suspicious. So it really is not looking good for Tara. And the public was really waiting for the police to arrest Tara. However, the public didn't know that police had gotten a tip about a woman who was believed to be the real woman in the clip with Tori. And that woman would be 18-year-old Terry Lynn McClintock. And yes, it's very confusing with the Terry, Tori, Tara, but I'm going to try and explain this as clearly as possible. So who is Terry Lynn? Terry, like I said, was 18 years old and she definitely did not have the best upbringing. She was in and out of the foster care system and started experimenting with drugs from a very early age. Now, Terry actually was arrested on April 12th, 2009. So just four days after Tori went missing on an unrelated arrest warrant. Terry had been seen by others participating in the search for Tori and handing out flyers. So when police asked her if she had anything to do with Tori's disappearance, she adamantly denied it. Now, wildly enough, Terry and Tara, so Tori's mother, were actually friends, not the best of friends by any means, and they were probably more, should be defined as acquaintances. They just ran in the same drug circle. So they definitely knew of each other. And when Terry was arrested, even though she denied having any connection to Tori's disappearance, police could still hold her because they had the arrest warrant. And police kind of just sat back and observed Terry. They observed her behavior and they pretty much put her under a microscope just because they did believe it was very possible that she had something to do with this based off of the tip that they had received. And Terry very much matched the physical description of the woman in the video with Tori. Police also saw that Terry got visitors that would come and see her in jail, or maybe I should just say one visitor. This visitor was her friend, 
28-year-old Michael Rafferty. Michael was unemployed at the time, and he certainly was no stranger to the dating game. He dated many, many women, and it is believed that he pimped out some of his previous ex-girlfriends. However, he himself did not have a criminal record. Now, Michael and Terry definitely had a friends with benefits type of relationship. Terry said that it was more of a dating relationship. However, when police asked Michael if him and Terry were dating, he really actually literally laughed it off and said, no, we're not dating. She's just my friend. Now, on one of Michael's visits to see Terry, police had gone up to him and asked if they could speak with him privately in regards to the Tory Stafford case. Now, Michael was very nonchalant about this whole situation, and he agreed to sit down with police and talk to them. Like I said, Michael wanted to make it very clear to police that Terry was not his girlfriend and that they were just friends. When police confronted Michael about the CCTV footage and asked if he recognized anyone in that video, which basically is them asking if he can recognize that that was Terry, he denied it. Police also asked Michael if he knew if Terry had the same coat as the woman in the video, which was a white coat. And while Michael did say that he knew that Terry had a long white coat, which is the one in the video, he didn't know if it was the same one. Now, police also asked Michael where he was the day that Tori went missing, and he claimed that he didn't know where he was, even though it literally was just several days prior. He said he didn't know what he was doing and that he was just quote unquote, zipping around town. So police pretty much got nothing out of him and Michael went home. And once Michael went home, that was pretty much it for several weeks. There was no new updates on this case. No one had any idea what happened to Tori and police were really at a standstill. Now, almost a month after her arrest on May 24th, 2009, Terry asked to speak with police and said that she knew more than she was letting on about Tori's case. And that would be an understatement. Now, do you guys know how much your subscriptions are really costing you? Because most Americans think that they spend around $80 a month on subscriptions when the actual cost is a lot closer to over $200. That's right, you could literally be wasting hundreds of dollars each month on subscriptions you don't even know about. But do not worry, I am here to save the day. There is an app that I love using and it takes care of all of that for me. It's called Rocket Money, which is formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. You may even find out you've been double charged for a subscription. And to cancel a subscription, all you have to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Cancel unnecessary subscriptions with Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash killer. Seriously, it could save you hundreds of dollars per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash killer. It's really so hard to imagine losing a loved one, whether that's a wife, a husband, a child. For many, it is their biggest fear. From Wondery, The Vanished is a podcast that tells the stories of often overlooked and unsolved missing persons cases. Every week, host Marissa Jones dives into a new case, sharing the details of their mysterious disappearance from interviews with the family, friends, law enforcement, and even suspects in an effort to reveal the truth. The Vanished has even aided in getting long overdue arrests through their in-depth interviews. Marissa reminds listeners of the human behind the headline and aims to help the family members find their vanished loved one, or at least a sense of peace. You guys know... Now, it's no secret, nor should it be no surprise, that I love a good true crime podcast, and this one is so good. I know how invested you guys get in unsolved cases, as do I, which is part of the reason I have been hooked on the Vanished podcast lately. So follow the Vanished on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in Apple Podcast or the Wondery app. Now, I'm sure you guys have probably heard about microdosing. Now, if not, you should know that all sorts of people are microdosing daily to feel healthier and perform better. And our show today is sponsored by Microdose Gummies. Microdose Gummies deliver perfect entry-level doses of THC that help you feel just the right amount of good. I've shared with you guys before that I have had horrible experiences in the past using THC because I never knew the right amount to take and it was 
always very confusing to me, but I am so happy to say that when I tested out the microdose gummies, it completely blew me away. They really do taste and feel amazing, and I've been using them to help me get in the zone when doing creative work, and they really help me at night when I just want to wind down and chill. Using the microdosing gummies are my favorite way to unplug and chill for the night. It feels so zen, and I'm so happy that I found something that works for me. They're really all around a 10 out of 10 for me. And microdose is available nationwide, and to learn more about microdose THC, go to microdose.com and use code KILLER to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. The links can be found in the show description, but again, that's microdose.com slash KILLER. When Terry sat down with authorities, she told them that on the morning of April 8th, her and Michael had a very disturbing conversation. And this conversation consisted of Michael and Terry planning on kidnapping a young girl. The way that Terry explained this conversation was that Michael was almost teasing her, saying, oh, you won't do it. You're not going to do it. You would never do it. You don't have the balls to kidnap a young girl. And during this, Terry, for whatever reason, felt compelled to prove Michael wrong. She said that she kept trying to one-up Michael and say, no, I will. I'll, I'll kidnap a young girl. I'll do it. And Michael pretty much called her on her bluff and said, okay, we're going to do this today. This is going to happen today. This is what our afternoon is going to consist of. Terry claimed that on the day of the abduction that Michael told her, quote, take a young female because the younger they are, the easier they are to manipulate, end quote. And again, if you're sitting here wondering why are they having this conversation? In what world does this conversation come up naturally? I couldn't tell you. I don't know, but let's continue. Now, according to Terry, she said that she waited outside of Tori's school and she didn't have her mind set out on Tori specifically. However, she claimed that Tori was the first young girl to walk out of the school and she saw that Tori was walking alone. So she figured that Tori would be an easy target. Now, in her confession, Terry insisted that if she knew what the outcome was going to be, if she knew how this would end, she would have never gone through with it. However, regardless, that doesn't really matter at this point, whether that's true or not, which it's probably the latter. When Terry spotted Tori, she walked up to her and started a conversation about puppies. Terry told Tori that she had a Shih Tzu puppy in her car, which coincidentally enough, Tori also had a Shih Tzu puppy at home. Now, whether Terry knew that beforehand through just knowing Tori's mom, Tara, we don't know, or if that was just a very big coincidence, but Tori obviously got excited and said that she wanted to see the dog. So that is when Terry and Tori started walking towards Michael's car. And once Tori was close enough to Michael's car, Terry pushed her inside of the vehicle and the three of them drove away. Michael had the radio on throughout the entire car ride to make sure that there wasn't an Amber Alert that was set out for Tori, which there wasn't at that point. The three of them began driving northeast and they made two stops along their way, one to a gas station convenience store and one to a Home Depot. Now, while at Home Depot, Terry was the one who went in the store while Michael waited in the car with Tori. According to Terry, she said that Michael had instructed her to purchase a claw hammer as well as garbage bags. Terry said that while she was in the Home Depot, she contemplated going back to her car or not, but she knew that she didn't want to leave Tori alone with Michael. Terry then went on to describe that they drove Tori to a rural area near Mountain Forest in Ontario, which is about 80 miles from where Tori lived. Now, in Terry's initial confession, which obviously means that there is another one that comes later, however, in the initial confession, Terry painted a picture that basically portrayed Michael as being the main and only person that conflicted any harm on Tori. Terry claimed that once Michael parked the car in this rural area, that he took Tori, threw her out of the car, began kicking her, brought her back into the car, 
then ended up raping her before putting a garbage bag over her head before hitting her repeatedly with a claw hammer. Now, like I said, Terry was painting this whole picture that Michael was the bad guy here, that he was the only one doing anything. And she claimed that while Michael was going through with all of this, she herself couldn't stand to watch, couldn't bear to listen. So she would go on these walks. She said that she would walk away for a couple minutes, then come back and she would see something or hear something. And then she would walk away again and then return again. So that was Terry's initial confession. And with that being said, obviously police now knew that they needed to talk to Michael. So they brought Michael in for an interrogation where he adamantly denied having anything to do with Tori's disappearance or murder. Now, I do have some clips from that interrogation that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to play that first clip right now. I didn't do anything. Well, that's not entirely true. Either. That is okay. entirely true. I, no. I didn't do anything. No, you can try and cement yourself into that, okay? But at the same time, you're not doing yourself any good by not being truthful here, okay? So police then went on to tell Michael that the gig was up and that Terry had confessed and went on to tell him what she had said. Now, the second clip that I'm about to play you is obviously only going to be audio, but you should know that in this video, Michael is quite literally curled up in the corner of the interrogation room, almost in the fetal position underneath a blanket. So here is that audio now me to tell you things I didn't do so I so I can get locked up for the rest of my life for this. What's your biggest fear or your biggest concern now that you've been charged with this? What's your biggest concern here? Losing my life. It means losing my life. It means not being able to have a life anymore. It means not taking care of my mom. It means not having to do the things that I do every day. It's she says on the 8th of April, Wednesday, the 8th of April, 2009, at 3.30 in the afternoon, you drop her off at Pavey, south of Fife, south of the public school, where Tori walks out of. You tell her to get a girl, and you want her young. She walks up the street, you drive up to the old age home where you park your car. She walks up to Tori. Tori's nice to her. She trusts her. She holds her hand for a little bit. She walks up the street with her. Terry Lynn tells her about her little dog gets her across the street to your car, opens the back door. Tori doesn't like it anymore. She pushes her in the car. You start driving. She says she's freaking out. She says she's worried about you. She's scared about what you're going to do. And you pull into a farmer's field right across from a house to the point where you're even asking her if anybody can see you. She says she goes for a walk. She doesn't want to see what happens. And then she comes back. And you're not sitting in the front seat anymore, Mike. You're sitting in the back seat. And she's not liking what she sees. So she walks away again. Then she comes back. And you make her hold one of those garbage bags while you put some of your clothes, and her jacket, and hammer in the garbage bag. Then you drive to a gas station. She never sees Tori again. Terry meant a liar. <laughs> Now, when police tell Michael everything that they know, he then goes on to call Terry a liar. And police decided to put that to the test. They actually brought Terry into the interrogation room with Michael. So here's that audio clip. This is your opportunity, Terry. Let's sit right here and tell us she's a liar. You've had no problem at saying with her out over the room. Terry's a liar. That's what you're hoping. I'm not even looking at her. I don't need to look at her. So if it wasn't clear from that audio clip, Michael initially struggles calling Terry a liar to her face and says that he didn't want to do it because he doesn't have to. Now, shortly after this, in late May of 2009, Michael Rafferty was charged with first-degree murder, assault causing bodily harm, and kidnapping. 
Terry was also charged with accessory to murder. That was her only initial charge. However, eight days later, her charges were changed and she was also charged with first degree murder. So Michael and Terry were said to have two separate charges trials. And while police knew that they had enough evidence to convict both Michael and Terry of this, they still were missing one very crucial thing, and that was Tori's remains. When speaking with police, Terry actually went ahead and sketched out everything that she remembered about the area that her and Michael were in. And she didn't know exactly where it was, but she gave them a general estimate. And on July 19th of 2009, police uncovered human remains near Mountain Forest in Canada. Tori's body was found unclothed from the waist down, and she was wearing a Hannah Montana t-shirt. Her autopsy confirmed that she had suffered a beating that resulted in her having lacerations to her liver and 16 broken ribs. However, her official cause of death was the result of the four to six blows to her head with a claw hammer. Now, like I said earlier, Terry had an initial confession and then she ended up changing her story. And it was actually surprising when she changed her story because usually when people change their story. They change it in a way that helps them. However, Terry's second confession was actually the opposite. During her second confession to police, Terry claimed that she did not know what Michael's plan was when they abducted Tori that day. So that part stayed the same. However, Terry claimed that once they brought Tori out to the rural area, she knew what Tori's fate would be. Now, Terry said that she did not want to be around to see what Michael was going to do to Tori, so she tried to walk away. However, Tori held on to Terry's hand and pretty much begged her not to walk away and not to leave her with Michael. However, Terry told Tori that she was a strong girl and that she would be okay before ultimately leaving her with Michael and walking away. Terry said that while she was walking away, she could hear Tori's screams as Michael was raping her. Terry said that hearing Tori's screams reminded her of her own childhood trauma and said that when she walked back to the car, she saw Michael throw Tori on the ground outside of the car after he had raped her. Terry then claimed that she walked over to Tori and began kicking her as she was lying on the ground. Terry then said that she placed a plastic bag over Tori's head and then began striking her several times with the claw hammer. She then claimed that her and Michael put Tori's body into garbage bags and covered her body with rocks underneath a tree. So instead of the initial story, which was pretty much painting Michael as the only person who was involved in any harm towards Tori, Terry confessed to being the one to actually murder her. Now, I think it's fair to say that both Michael and Terry did deplorable, despicable, unforgivable acts but Terry confessed to being the one who actually murdered her. So she ended up pleading guilty. Now, during Michael's trial, on the other hand, he pled not guilty and his defense team tried to argue that Michael didn't have any part of Tori's death and that this was all completed and executed by Terry alone. They claimed all of it was her idea and he was just with her while this all took place. Michael claimed that Terry told him that she abducted Tori for drug debt and told him to perform sexual acts on Tori. And he also claimed that he did not rape Tori. However, he helped in the disposal of her body. Now, during the autopsy, because of how badly Tori's body was decomposed, they weren't ever able to determine if she had experienced sexual assault. However, because she wasn't wearing anything from the waist down, they were able to pretty much assume that that was the case. So this really is turning into a he said, she said. Terry is telling police that Michael's the one that made up this whole thing about let's kidnap a girl today. However, she then admits to being the one to carry out with the killing. And then Michael is saying that he had no part in this other than pretty much being along for the ride for lack of a better phrase. 
So like I said, both Michael and Terry were said to have separate trials. However, because she pleaded guilty to first degree murder, Terry obviously didn't go through with the trial. However, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years. And then on March 5th of 2012, Michael's trial began, and several months later, on May 11th, 2012, a jury found him guilty of kidnapping, sexual assault, and first-degree murder, and he was also sentenced to prison without parole. So you would think at this point, Michael and Terry locked up forever, which they both deserve, plus tenfold over that. However, they're both locked up. But surprisingly enough, in October of 2018, Terry was actually transferred from the prison that she was at to a rehabilitation facility. She was transferred to a healing lodge called Okima Oki, which I'm probably butchering. However, it is run by the correctional services in Canada. Now, even though this healing lodge is run by the correctional services in Canada, you can imagine the outrage of the public because you are putting someone who murdered a child into a healing lodge. And the other inmates in this same facility were also outraged that someone who committed a act this heinous and this deplorable is now almost getting like a slap on the wrist here, go to the healing lodge. If there's anyone who doesn't need to be in a healing lodge, it is a child murderer. Now, this specific healing lodge is a minimum to medium security operation, and inmates that are kept there are actually not put behind bars at all, and instead of being called inmates, they're referred to as residents of the lodge. Now, this is a smaller facility. They hold around 50 women and only have 60 beds. And the cost of housing an offender at this lodge is $167,000, whereas the average cost of maintaining an offender in a traditional prison is $191,000. Now, during the day, residents attend a series of classes, including horse therapy and job training and parenting skills and other classes. Now, as far as security goes on the premise, there is no fence or barbed wire, The only thing keeping the inmates there are guards who more often than not are not armed as well as video surveillance cameras. Now, I am not saying by any means that this is not a great option for some people and that this is not a great facility for some. However, I think it's all very circumstantial and I think it's by a person to person basis. And I certainly don't believe that a woman who murdered a child allowed her to be raped a lot. Whoever's story is right. Neither story makes it okay for Terry to be put in this healing lodge. And even the chief of this facility actually didn't know that Terry was being transferred there until he heard about it on the news. Because as you can imagine, the public was furious about this. So he had no idea that Terry was even there until after he heard about it on the news. So that just goes to show you how kind of loose the whole transferring process is. And even the chief came out and claimed that even though he heavily disagreed with the decision of having Terry in his facility, he has no control over who gets transferred. Now, luckily, due to public outcry, only a little over a month later, on November 7th of 2018, Terry was transferred back to a federal prison where she is currently staying, and she won't be eligible for parole until 2031 which even then seems like a very big stretch. 2031 for parole doesn't seem like enough. So hopefully she does not end up getting parole. Now, with that being said, you guys, that is the case of Tori Stafford. We will probably never know whose story is more accurate, whether that be Michael's or whether that be Terry's. Does it really matter at the end of the day whose story is more right? No, because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is that Tori's life was ripped away from her in the most brutal and horrific way possible. Personally, what I hope out of this case is that Tori and Michael stay in prison for the rest of their lives. I don't believe that they deserve parole for a second. Neither of them do. 
But I'm very interested to see what you guys have to say about this case. So with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and again, every Thursday on YouTube as well. And you're not gonna wanna miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Bye.